can't hear it on the speakers? I feel like I can. But actually, no, because I'm tapping it and there's, there's nothing. Oh, oh, I take it back. The mute was working. <laughs> Imagine that. All right, so I'm just going to keep talking, make sure that you guys can dial it in. Actually, I'll tell you what, since we're getting, while there's all setting that up, we're going to be in Luke 16 today. Luke 16, if you guys want to pop out your phones, we can kind of go through it together. All right, is it, are you getting the meter on both sides and stuff? Yes. All right, cool. So let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father. You are exempt. You do not need to. You, are, <laughs> you have your hands full. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you because you are a great God who brought us into your house, Lord. You provide all great things for us, Lord, and truly your glory just fills the environment, Lord. It fills the heavens, the earth, Lord. Everywhere we go, we see it. So, Lord, I ask that you just be with us right now in this upper room, Lord. I ask that you fill this place with your spirit. I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy, Lord, that these are your words and not my Lord's Lord, to deliver to your people. Lord, more importantly, I ask that this is something that isn't just something we, we speak about right now, not something that we just hear. But Lord, I ask for every single one of us here, Lord, that you, you point out exactly in our life where you want us to apply this, changes that you want to see, Lord. And I ask that you give us the courage and the strength to walk through those changes, Lord. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our sins because we know that they are many, Lord. In your holy, precious Son's name, through the intercessions of all your saints from our tears, here as we pray one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but the lotion that you want through Christ Jesus our Lord. For the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so for anybody that was here last week, I told you guys what I was going to cover today, and I told you that I actually had to push it out a week because I had a really, really hard time with this parable. I also told you exactly where we are, which is Luke 16. Can anyone, does anyone remember what parable we're covering? All right, so it's Luke 16, 1 is where it starts. So now all you need to know is how to read. Yes, <laughs> just do it. And I will tell you, like, like I said, I wanted to talk about this last week, but um, dude, this parable is a challenge. This is a parable that every single time I read it, it's like there's aspects of it where I just personally did not kind of dig into it because it didn't make any sense to me. Um, and then when I started kind of preparing it last week uh, in complete transparency, I just started too, too late in the week and it was really, really hard. So I just said, I just need more time with this one. So um, I pushed it to this week. And even when I was preparing for this week, um, I realized it wasn't just me because even the fathers, the fathers refer to this as probably one of the most difficult parable. Uh, and it's called the parable of the unrighteous um, steward. It's in 16.1. I'm going to read through it real quick, just 1 through 13. And then we'll start kinda, kind of uh, diving in. It says, and then he also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward and an accusation was brought against him so that the man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do for my master is taking his stewardship away from me? I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do. And then when I am put out of the stewardship, that they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write down 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write down 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd than the generations of the sons of light. And, he's, and I say to you, make, make friends of yourselves by unra unrighteous manna, and um, that when, they, when you fail, you may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is the least is faithful in as much to he who is unjust the, in what he is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous man, and you will continue to trust, wait, who will continue to trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, 
or else you will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So if I'm hoping that that is somewhat familiar to you guys. I've kind of heard this story before, but I will tell you the hardest part of that is you've got this parable and you have Christ teaching about it. And what is he teaching? He's basically praising the guy for stealing from his master. And that kind of like blows your mind because you're kind of like, all right, I, I don't understand exactly what's going on here. So we're going to spend a little time kind of processing through this together. So I want you guys to think about this. Clearly, the owner, the landlord, the master, right, he had heard that this guy was basically mishandling his stuff. So the, the owner basically calls him, calls the steward, and basically calls him on it. And he's basically telling him, I'm going to fire you. Right? Like this, this has come to an end, right? Like you, you've been outed. So he must have known something because he called the steward and he says, give an account of your stewardship. So I just want to kind of like dro drop this real quick and, and I want us all to think about this idea that you had, you know, the owner call the steward and basically told them, give an account of your stewardship. And I tell you that every single one of us here We'll have a day where we get asked to give an account of your stewardship, right? We aren't getting away with anything. We're not going to pull one past, you know, and the steward had to answer to his master and the day will come where we have to answer to our master. And really the fathers were all in agreement that this steward was basically embezzling funds from the master in one way or another. You know, there were some of them that thought that, you know what, he was either increasing the rate of what people actually owed, almost kind of like the tax collectors would do, where if Meg had owed me, you know, 80, I would be like, hey, Meg, did you owe me 100? And he was keeping that spread, which made it possible for him to, you know, write down the, the, the debt without the master knowing or without the owner knowing. Um, some of the fathers were also saying, well, no, this was, this was, um, this was an issue of he was probably living very lavishly, right? Like he was squandering the owner's goods. And even though like it was in his right to be a steward of it, but he was mishandling the way that he was basically spending those resources on himself. But no matter what it is or what exactly he was doing to mishandle it, um, he was not being honest. He was not an honest steward. So we need to think about this idea of stewardship because every single one of us will be asked to give an account for our stewardship, right? For some of us, it might be, how do we manage our wealth? Like, are we spending our money in a way that, that glorifies God or that we are acting like it's his and we're stewards of it? For others of us, it could be, how did you manage your marriage? For others of us, how did you manage your children? Are you a good steward? Because if we have to be honest with ourselves, everything that we have comes from God. We don't possess anything. And we are stewards for his kingdom. And I started to think about this concept of stewards, right? And it's easy when we say, okay, what am I doing with my money? What am I doing with my marriage? What am I doing with my, with my kids, my household? Like That's all the stuff that I think it's, it's easy for us to give account to, right? But let me ask you this. How are you manning, managing the intangible things? How are you managing your time? We all have the same amount of time. How do you manage it? How much do you use for you? How much do you use for others? And how much do you use for God, his service and his purpose? How about your talents? This is one of the things where it's very convicting for me because I feel like a lot of the times God gives every single one of us gifts and talents. I, I've never met anybody who doesn't have a gift or a talent. But then we take those gifts and talents and we apply them professionally. And we end up being very successful. And we can get promotions and we can get raises and we can make a lot of money. And that's great because God gave us these gifts and talents as we're channeling it for our own benefit. But God is saying, didn't I give you some of those gifts and talents for my glory? To use it to my service? That was, that was God's purpose of giving it to us. Not so we can have nicer cars, bigger houses, more resources, more liquidity. Every single one of us has a gift and a talent that he has specifically for his purpose. But sometimes we miss that. How about our influence? Do we have influence? And when we have influence, do we use it for our own gain? Or do we use it to bring people to the church, to bring people to Christ? 
See, because all of that stuff matters too. And all of these things are things that I believe that, you know, there's going to be in a day we have to give account. We have to give account, right? And we all cringe about the fact of this idea of giving account. It's a scary topic. And I'll tell you, it's much, much scarier when you're reading it in the Bible and the letters are in red, when Christ himself is addressing it. You know, and I will tell you that we all have that moment. Like even at work, I've had to terminate employees because they've done some stupid stuff. You know, they did something very short-sighted. They didn't realize what was on the other side of that decision. And I can honestly say that every single time, every single time, when that moment of accountability hits in, it hits them right between the eyes. Surprised every single time, right? And the, the thing is, it's, it's, they knew what, what they were doing was wrong, but they never thought that they would get caught. They thought it would go unnoticed. They thought like, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do this because I'm never going to have to give account. That's not the case. We'll always have to give account and it's never worth it. And you can tell in the story with this unjust steward, it was no different, right? Because you can tell by the response of his situation, he had already, he was, he was worried, he was terrified, right? Also, there's a little hint in there that this guy was not a young guy. He was probably older because of the fact one of the first things he said is, I can't dig, right? I can't, I can't dig. Probably means he's a little bit older. He, he was not about that physical activity life, okay? He also says, I'm too ashamed to beg, so you can tell that, you know, all of that lavish living or the stealing or the embezzling, whatever he was doing, where he thought that this was great, when the time of accountability came, he realized this was not worth it. Because we're all going to have to give account. He made bad decisions, right? So what did he do? He, decided, he, he made a bold decision. He decided to take a little off of the tab of each one of his master's debtors so that they may receive me into their houses. Because he knew that he had been exposed. The master knew what he was up to. He knew that that ship had set sail. And now he's like, great, like this is over. I need to worry about what's next, right? And since he knew that the bridge was burned with his master, like that, that, that was done, he would use his current position to prepare him for the next stage of his life. And that's the part that's so confusing, right? Because what he did, was it right or was it wrong? It was wrong. It's wrong. It's very clear. It was wrong, right? But you have the master who actually commended the unjust uh, steward. And that was a part that just, it floored me. And I'm like, how are we commending the guy who's clearly wrong, right? And this is his last act of stealing, like on his way out, right? But then, like when I was reading the commentary, he said, you got to understand that he didn't commend the action. I mean, he didn't, like, yeah, he didn't commend saying, hey, that's good way to go, right? He commended the fact that he was, he had dealt shrewdly. He did not approve of the actions. He did not approve of the conduct. He didn't say, hey, that was a great idea, but he approved of the fact that he was being shrewd. So then I said, okay, what's the definition of shrewd? Definition of shrewd is the quality of having or showing good powers of judgment, right? So he basically said is, I commend your, like, you know, your thought process. Like, I see what you're doing here. Like, you wanted something, and you thought of, okay, what's the best thing for you here, right? So just the fact that this guy had the thought process to say, hey, I've got to think past today, right? Like if you want something, you got to kind of go get it, right? So this, this aspect of him being shrewd is what was commended, right? And Christ also added the thought of, you know, current businessmen, which is what I kind of paraphrase, but it says, you know, the sons of the world, right? Had a more forward thinking mentality of the people of God. He's basically saying that like, dude, the sons of the world are better at this than the sons of light. So this is why it's so difficult with this parable, right? Because Christ is using a dishonest man as an example for the disciples. Because God sometimes uses evil things that are familiar just to make a point. I think we also see this, these illustrations happening in the writings of St. Paul. You know, St. Paul talked about war, he talked about training, he talked about sports, talked about slavery. Um, all his examples of the Christian life. And even though this man was clearly dishonest, it was a great example for a few points. Okay? First of all, 
He knew that he would be called for an account for his life, and he took that seriously. Okay? Because at this point, when he was called for accountability, he knew that he would, there was a price to pay. He knew that there was a consequence on the other side of his bad decision. Okay? Because um, at first, he thought that he was going to be able to get away with it. Right? Like, God knows how long he had been, like, the, the guy in this parable, and I know it's just a story, but he knew for a while now that he had been skimming off the top. Okay? He probably never thought the master was going to call him on it, but the master did. And at this point, he realized, crap, now that I'm held accountable, there's going to be something on the other side here. Right? And I'm going to have to plan for that. The second thing is he took advantage of his, his limited current time in his position right, to prepare for himself a comfortable future. He says, I'm only here for so long, right, before I basically get, like, escorted out of this place, right? But since I'm only going to be here for so long, I need to prepare for my future, and I want it to be comfortable. And I will tell you that if we had that ability, if we had that ability to be able to see that what we're living in right now is temporary, that the day's gonna come when this is over. And what we do now is gonna decide on what, whatever happens next on whether or not we're gonna be comfortable. Because he got that, he understood that, and then he acted appropriately. Because our stay here is not permanent. But at least this unjust steward understood I have to prepare for what's coming next, right? And the comparison is 100% true with the businessman and the sons of light, right? Sons of the world versus sons of light. And Christ himself is basically saying, I wish we were more like the businessman in this aspect, which you would never expect Christ to, to basically compare that, okay? Because the sons of men at the time, like the business people, the money traders, all of these people, they had a bad reputation. But there's one thing that we can be in agreement on. They were successful at what they wanted to do. And I'm going to tell you, do you know anyone that started their own business? And was it easy? No. I'll be honest with you, you guys know I'm a banker, so I work at a business bank. All I do basically for a living is I meet a, I meet a bunch of business owners, and usually when I meet these business owners, you know the first thing they love to tell me is? They love to tell me their story, right? Like how they got into business, how hard it was, what they did, how they succeeded, all of this other stuff. And do you know why they all love talking about it? because it was hard and they fought for it and they, had, they needed diligence. And then after all of that hard work and perseverance, it was successful. But it never happens on accident, right? It takes determination. So think about what Christ is saying here. He says, look at what these guys are doing to, pers to, to pursue and to achieve what's important to them. Look at how shrewd they are to make sure that they get what they need, right? And what Christ is basically saying is like, if we pursue the kingdom of heaven with that same drive, that same passion, that same zeal, right? If we pursued, you know, if the sons of God pursued heaven, like the sons of man pursued, you know, money and profits and pleasure, like our spiritual lives would drastically look different. Drastically look different. Are we shrewd when it comes to the things of God? Or are we just totally passive? Like it happens when it happens. I'm going to show up on Sundays. We're going to be good, you know? And, that, and, that's, and that's what it is, right? And then I was reading this commentary and the guy made a great point. And he said, what's better, the word of God or coffee? Right? Like we, got, we have the good news. We have salvation. We have blessings. We have all of these things, right? And he says, what is, what is better, that or coffee? because we have way more Starbucks than we have in churches. <laughs> Hide your cup. <laughs> but it's true though, right? Because someone decided that they wanted to sell a lot of coffee and they are doing a phenomenal job at it. But we have the church who our product is way better than a cup of coffee. What we offer is way better than burnt bitter coffee. But we're not growing. And the only reason is because they're more shrewd. They want it more than we do. 
right? And then he goes and he takes off this other tangent where he says, make friends for yourselves, the unrighteous man, and for when you fail, that they may receive you into an everlasting home. And Christ here is starting, you know, to transfer a little bit, right? Because what he's starting to talk about is sooner or later, you're going to have to plan ahead for eternity, right? Sooner or later, you're going to need an everlasting home. The same way that this steward, like, it had run out. His time had run out, and he never started to think about what was coming next, right? And Christ is making this point of managing and trusting your riches. The unrighteous manna. Yeah, I got this great quote, and I loved it. It says, riches promise much. They perform nothing. They excite hope and confidence and deceive in both. And in making a man dependent on them for happiness, they rob him from the salvation of God and of eternal glory. And I felt like I, I'm going to read that one more time just because I know it's a lot. Riches promise much. And I think we'll all agree, right? If I just had just, just one more zero, right? One more comma, just, you know, maybe another six months of reserves, you know, whatever it is that you say, if I just had that, it promises so much, right? But it performs nothing. What is the last thing that your money really did for you, right? Like, let's say you close on the new house. Like, that's cool, right? For how long? Because that gets old. The new house doesn't stay new forever, right? And then I'll be honest with you, I even, I was thinking about this the other day with some, some people that I know. You acquire and you acquire and you acquire, right? And all of the blessings that you once counted as blessings are now a, a curse because it is the same burden that is preventing you from enjoying all of those things because now you have so much overhead. A lot of wealth, but a lot of overhead. And you lose the joy in that as well, right? They excite hope and confidence. They excite it, but they deceive in both. Making a man depend on them for happiness because we all know that if that's the road you're, wa you're walking on for happiness, then you're measuring with the wrong ruler and you're never going to catch it. You're never going to catch it. And they rob us from what's really important, which is actually being joyful in the, in the glory and the salvation of God. <clears throat> and I love what it says. It says that when you fail, you may receive, that they may receive you in, into an everlasting home. See, because money can fail us. And if you haven't seen it, ask somebody else. Because money can definitely set, see it. But he's basically saying, keep your eyes on an everlasting home. Think about what is next. Just like the unwise steward, think about your eternity. It's not about where we are today, but it's going to be about where we're called to be, whether it be tomorrow, a year from now, 10 years from now, we don't know, right? But don't be short-sighted. It was funny, we, uh, I just, we had somebody who applied for a position at my bank. So we interviewed this guy, and I saw that he had worked with um, some people on my team before at like a previous bank. So I called these other coworkers, right, about three of them, and I said, hey, what do you think of this guy? this guy? This guy posted for a position. And they said, if you hire that guy, I quit. So the first time, I was like, okay, well, that's a little dramatic, right? So I hang up. <laughs> I call the second employee. I said, hey, this person just applied. Resume looks good. I saw that you guys work together. What do you get? If you hire that guy, I'm out of here. Okay. So third time, I got the same exact feedback. So I'm like, what's going on with this guy? And they said, Pete, this is the thing. This guy, when we worked together, he was all about himself. Right? He wouldn't split deals. He wouldn't do this. He wouldn't do that. If I needed help on something, he would never help me. He was totally self-absorbed. Right? And he's the type of guy that would you know, you know, step over you, to, you know, if it was in his best interest. And then I felt kind of bad. right? But then it kind of hit me at the same time. I said, this guy who applied for this, so short-sighted. Right? For him, it was about every deal. It was about every client. It was about, I need this and this and this and this and this, right? And he might have won those deals, that client. He might have scored a bigger commission. But you know what he did? He basically burnt that bridge to prevent him from future, for his entire future. Because banking is a close-knit industry. And I wonder how many of us right now, we are so focused on what's right now, what's right in front of us. Like, what do I want bad really right now? But the decisions we're making, they are impeding our future. And possibly even our eternity. And then, he, and, then, and then Christ starts talking about something else. He says, who is faithful in the least is faithful also in the much. 
And if you are not faithful with the least, then you will not be faithful with the much, right? And let's just be honest. In Christ's eyes, do you know what the easiest thing for him is? You know what the least of everything that he trusts us with? What do you guys think that is? The least. Like Christ is just like, if you squander anything, just squander this. What do you think? No ideas? Money. Money. Money is the least of things for Christ. He really, you really think about it, he couldn't care less about it. Right? Even when he was on earth, <laughs> he could, somebody hit him up and say, hey, can we pay the tax? It's like a denarii. He's like, I, 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 I don't got it. Right? Like, I don't, I don't got it. But what you can do is you can go fishing, you can catch a fish, and it'll be in his mouth. Right? Like, that's how little that Christ cared about money. And it's funny <clears throat> because Christ will look at that and he says, if you are not faithful with that, how can I give you more? And when I'm talking about more, I'm not talking about more money. I'm talking about more responsibility, more stewardship, more anything, right? Because if, you know, if you're looking at what can I be faithful in, right? So there's the aspect of start low with your money, right? But then we start getting into the weightier things, right? Like, how do you spend your time? Right? Are you faithful in your time with him? Are you faithful in your prayer closet? Are you faithful that you want to meet him, that you want to be in the word of God? I will tell you that if we are not doing that stuff in our houses when nobody else is watching, then we are failing miserably. Right? I don't care what we look like when we show up on Sundays here. Right? If you got your clean pressed shirt on, right? if you're you know, singing the hymns and you're first one in line for communion and you're doing all of that stuff, you're raising your hands when we pray. If you are not doing that stuff at home, then you are losing. Losing. That is what is called. That is being faithful in the small things. The small things when nobody's looking, the small things when nobody sees it, the things that, how do you spend your time when, you, when it's your decision to? In the mornings, do you wake up a little bit early? Do you spend a little bit of time with God? At night, do you pray if you didn't do it in the morning or if you do it at night or if you do it both, right? Like it's, easy to sh it's easier to show up here every Sunday because we all know that we expect to see each other here. We all know that Abuna expects us here. We all know that like this is like the right thing to do and there's a little bit of social pressure to show up as well. What do you do when it's just purely your desire, purely your want? Because I will tell you, if we are missing there, don't expect to be trusted with the spiritual things. Don't expect the spiritual riches. Because we, if we cannot be faithful in the small things, he will not trust us with more. Right? And then, you know, Christ, again, now he specifically is talking about money. Right? He says, if you're not faithful with money, you will not be trusted with real riches. We need to be good managers of our resources so that we could be trusted with even more. Because, like I said, Christ himself, when he walked this earth, he was poor. He didn't have anything. People wanted to follow him. He says, I got no place to lay my head. Right? Like, that's, that's how he lived. So this is not refer to how much you have. I know spiritual people that have a lot. I know spiritual people that don't have anything. The question is, is how do you manage it? What do you do with it? Because each one of us will be called to give an account. So the question is, have you been faithful? Like, have we been faithful stewards? If we got the call and God told us, give an account, what would we say? Because this is, this is from the parable, right? It's, it was the steward's job to manage the resources of the master. It belonged to the master. It was always the master's. But it was in the possession of the steward. And is that the way that we view our lives? Is your stuff yours? Or does it belong to the master and you're just the steward? Because don't get confused. Everything that you own, you don't own. It all belongs to God. And we must see that we are managing his resources correctly. And then ultimately, the, resort, the, the result of that, when we're handling it correctly, is that we'll be very, very comfortable at our next stop. Because that's the goal, right? Because this will come to an end. And then he finishes it with no one can serve two masters. Having two masters is like having two jobs. And this is the thing that I want to point out to everybody. Is it is worded so strongly here 
not only did he say that you cannot serve two masters, he says you will love one and you will hate the other. So if you think, hey, I've got this and I'm just going to balance them, you are not above the word of God. You are not. Not, not a single one of us here. So we have to make a decision. If we can't serve two masters, which master will it be? And glory be to God forever. Amen. Stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, name one God. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, and we thank you for this example, Lord, this parable that you spent the time just to teach us. For, Lord, so many times I will confess that I forget that it's all yours, that I am nothing other than a steward, Lord. And sometimes I even think that, you know, my resources are, are, are due to, to maybe my own work or our success or, you know, it's our job to grow it and it's our job to do this and it's our job to do that, Lord. But ultimately, I ask that you just, for everyone in this room, Lord, that we just remember it all comes from you. It all comes from you, Lord, and it is all for you. And Lord, I ask that you just, uh, that you work in our hearts, Lord, to, to open our eyes to the things that you want done with your resources, Lord. And I don't mean just money, Lord. Money is the least of it, Lord. Our gifts, our talents, our time. For Lord, not only does everything that we possess belong to you, Lord, but even as a person, Lord, we belong to you. So I ask that we be faithful even with ourselves. For we were created for a purpose, Lord, and the purpose was yours. It's not for for us to, you know, to have great careers and to make a ton of money or to do this or to that, Lord, but ultimately every single one of us were created for your purpose and you have a plan for that. So I ask, Lord, that, uh, that you just open our eyes this week, Lord, to the things that you've called us to, how you want us to act, where you want us to steward, and maybe areas of our life where we are not currently faithful, that you would like to see some changes. And I ask that you open our eyes to what those changes are. For, Lord, we know that we are created for you, and only in you will we be satisfied. I ask that you be with us in this coming week of Thanksgiving, Lord. I ask that you allow us just to sit in your presence and just let us truly feel how much we have to be thankful for. We are a very blessed people, Lord. So I ask that you just never let us forget that, Lord. Let us be humbled in your presence, Lord, and let us give from, because we have so much abundance. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our sins, that you strengthen us, Lord. Hear these prayers, lips, and sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother. All the saints and martyrs, hear us when we pray in one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.